Zoom call if you have any questions along the way. Um, I will leave it up to our exhibitions director, Richard Klein, who also curated the show to introduce the artists and welcome you all. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we had some technical problems uh, this afternoon, ironically, because of the wind. And we're, we're joined by uh, two artists who work with moving air. And uh, the windstorm that swept through uh, since yesterday and today interrupted power up in Cornwall, Connecticut. So Dave Colbert is actually joining us from uh, Tim's house, which is adjacent to the studio, because uh, where he lives, there's no electricity currently. Uh, Tim Prentice After the Mobile is a two-part exhibition of one of the most innovative artists whose work has expanded the field of motion and sculpture. Tim has been a resident of Connecticut since 1975, and After the Mobile marks his first solo museum exhibition since 1999. The interior portion of the exhibition opened this weekend and runs through October 4th, and the exterior portion, which will include six works, runs from September 19th through April 24th of next year. And the reason that the, there are two parts that are separated, it, uh, it had to do really with the pandemic and how the pandemic affected our exhibition schedule uh, over the course of this year into next year. The exhibition and its associated programming is also acknowledging David Colbert, who's joining us tonight, uh, an artist in his own right, who evolved from a studio assistant to become Prentice's artistic partner with the establishment of Prentice Colbert in 2012. David was born in 1956 in New York City and has worked with Prentice in various capacities for 40 years now. And is not only the co-author of many of the works in the show, but also uh, has been instrumental in both the organization and installation of the exhibition. In fact, I think I could truthfully say was pretty much single-handedly um, installed the, the major works in the show. Um, Tim was born in New York City in 1930. Uh, his sculpture has been the subject of recent one-person exhibitions at Gallery Van Bartha and uh, Basel, Switzerland in 2005, the Robert Lehman Art Center in North Andover, Massachusetts in 2007, Maxwell Davidson Gallery in New York City in 2015, and his work was included in the exhibition, The Art of Movement, Alexander Calder, George Rickey, and Tim Prentice at the Westmoreland Museum of American Art in, Greensburg, in Greenberg, Pennsylvania in 2017. Prentice has completed over 140 commissions worldwide to date, including uh, with locations including um, uh, Hatsfield Atlanta International Airport in 2009, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston in 2011, General Mitchell International Airport in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 2012, uh, Stanford Law School in California, 2012, uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown uh, in 2016, and Tampa International Airport um, in Florida in 2017, and most recently, Domin Dominion Energy in Richmond, Virginia in 2019. I mentioned that group show, um, The Art of Movement with Alexander Calder and George Rickey, because um, uh, Tim, along with those two artists, are really the people who have def defined uh, movement and sculpture uh, in the past, uh, well, really 80 years. And each of them, they're each, they're three different generations. Uh, uh, Calder being uh, the, the first artist who dealt with kind of movement and sculpture, George Rickey being the second, and, uh, and Tim being the third. And uh, tonight we're gonna to talk about the exhibition and hopefully talk a little bit about the influences that went into making this kind of work. Um, and uh, we're starting actually in the, uh, the lobby of the museum, which you're, uh, uh, I guess we're seeing now. Um, Tim and David, um, I guess the question more for Tim is, uh, take us back in the influences of how you ended up making work like this because you started out your career as an architect. Right. Well, my, I had the model of my father, but I, uh, I was taken to a, a Addis Museum in, in Andover, Massachusetts when I was a teenager uh, and saw my first Calder. And I was with a group of kids who were in the building for an hour or so looking at uh, landscape paintings and 19th century portraits and so on. But I, when they were finished with that and they came back through the lobby, I was, I, I was still there. I never got past the Calder that was in the lobby. So that's sort of a slick way of saying that's where the hook went in. <laughs> but ever since then, I've been obsessed with, with his ing ingenuity and his fantastic variety and the extent to which he went. And uh, 
but I went on to architecture because I, I didn't dare presume to be an artist or anything like as such like that. And um, finally it got the better of me. And, and then when Ricky came along, I realized that Caller had, there was still turf out there possibly to be uh, claimed because uh, Calder had done so much, you, you first wonder whether or not he did, didn't do it all. But uh, so I came out of an architectural background, which he didn't have. He was a, actually a, studied engineering. Uh, but anyway, so, so I, as you see, sort of have this geometric thread that runs through everything that's quite different. His forms come more out of serialism, I think, than, than anything. And, and when Ricky came along, actually, he was more, he really thought about the movement and the air and how to use the mayor. And I think Calder was quite different. He was about balance. Anyway, I forgot the question. Well, you know, that's absolutely true. But I, I think that the main difference that I find in, in the work is that Calder's work, when it moves, you know, you know, it, the, the wind is pushing it. You, you're kind of aware of that. Ricky's work, there's always a sense of mystery. Like many cases you encounter Ricky's sculpture and you have no idea why they're moving. And That's you, exactly you, right. You suddenly realize, oh, the air is pushing them around. Your work, it's very clear where what's happening. And uh, we're looking now actually in the lobby at a, at a piece called uh, Light Curtain. And um, there's several, we're gonna to see today, there are several varieties of work that you that have been made over the years uh, besides, uh, oh no, white carpet, excuse me. I'm sorry, yeah. white curtain. There, are, there are, are carpets, there are curtains, and there are banners, which just among the, the variety of work. But um, I find the carpets in particular are extremely evocative of air movement. And uh, particularly because they kind of look like looking up or looking down at the sky, whether you're looking up at them like you're looking at a deck of clouds or you're looking down at them like yeah. you're on an aircraft looking down. And um, we've opened the, the, the uh, lobby doors actually to activate this a little bit more than it usually gets activated. I don't know, uh, the two of you want to talk a little bit about, um, about the carpets. Well, the, they present us with a problem, an interesting problem. I mean, this piece you're looking at, we could take it outside, I don't know about today, it's very windy today, but on a normal afternoon and take wonderful photographs of it curling and moving and undulating in the most wonderful ways, unpredictable and so on, and really quite tipping up on its edge and moving all over the place. And you can't get, you, you don't want winds like that inside your museum or any other space you're trying to live in. So, and people want, they say, that's great. Let's have one in our lobby and it's not possible. So, and and it, it, obviously if you had this piece outside, the first thunderstorm or windstorm like today would, would wreck it, would just tie it up into a great bundle and throw it on the ground. So the question is how can you get a piece to do those things outside and it's safe to leave it outside year in and year out and, and take the winds as they come. And the way to do that, you see the little rectangles there, they're, they're uh, the sails, if you like. And if you made a piece like that without the sails it, it, and, and it was built lightly enough and strong enough, it would be able to take the wind and move in, in an interesting way on a calm day and then not fall apart on a, on a stormy day. Inside, you're safe, so you can have a lot of sail area. But uh, Amulet, just... can we pan around to uh, the big fish? Uh, David, you want to say something? I... Yeah, I could add a, a few words about the carpet. So um, as Tim was saying, there's quite a difference between outdoor and indoor work. And most of the series of works, you, all the works in this show are kinds of pieces that belong to quite a lot of series, quite a lot of examples of them. And most of our work is indoors. And in this particular piece that's at the Aldrich, I feel in a sense it's, our, it's one of our most successful carpets because of how very, how very light it is. Um, the challenge is how to eliminate any extraneous weight and give it the most flexibility it can have um, without it, uh, it becoming chaotic. So in this, in this case here, all you have is a surface of elements and very, very 
very um, light wires. All the balancing is done with wires and the elements. And there was a, a trick to eliminate every extraneous piece of weight in that sculpture. Let's, uh, let's go upstairs and look at it from, from uh, above now. And I think one of the key things about these works is they, they seem so ephemeral, but when you look at them close up, the amount of craftsmanship and labor and materiality in, in them is actually quite extreme, but on a very, very, um, as, as David said, lightweight level, like this attempt to make things as insubstantial as possible, but trying to figure out how to make them um, incredibly robust at the same time. And the, these array of wa bent wires that, that form the structures of these things are amazing, uh, amazingly um, durable, but also the, the, rep the repetition in them is uh, captivating. And I, I think we could see, uh, and I mean, I don't know if we could see with the light coming in right now. When we go into the other gallery, maybe we could see a close up of some of the wire. It's very hard to see the detail now with the light in the museum. That's, but the uh, overall, overall idea is for the piece to be uh, absolutely neutral and the air is what makes the art. So the air is the ultimate artist and it's the, it's the wild hair you can't predict. And so we, we just passed through a space with a, a, a series of small works of Tim's, but we're going to look now at a piece uh, called Oculus or, or uh, double Oculus, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Two oculi. <laughs> two oculi. Yes. And uh, Naomi, if you could go up and look, get very close to it so we could see the, the actual construction. Sorry. Whoop. I'm not taking this call. Mm -hmm. You could see that there's these extremely uh, insubstantial small bent wire elements that control the movement and limit the movement of, of the work. And uh, David, I know, is involved in, in a lot of the, from the very beginning, involved in a lot of the fabrication and wire bending. I don't know, David, if you want to talk, uh, address that issue directly. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, how long have we got? Uh, <laughs> so when I started with Tim, I, uh, that's what I did. I, I bent wire. I was a wire bender. And... Um, uh, it probably drove Tim a little crazy because I liked to arrange all the widgets, we call them, on the tables in these patterns. But the, uh, the process of, of bending the wire, it's, um, it can be meditative. Uh, we now have a couple other guys who do that. And it can be frustrating, but uh, mostly meditative, I found it. The uh, every single bend and every wire has a purpose. You know, if we were there and you asked us, why is that particular bend there? It's always to have some way of, of controlling the movement. So uh, I, I view the, uh, the, the widgets as sort of the, the brains of the sculpture in a way, the sort of spinal column, the kind of all the all the nerves it's what holds everything everything together tim said something very provocative um when we were organizing the show about how as um as he focused more on engineering the work became more beautiful and tim i don't know if you want to comment on that uh -huh. I, think it's, <laughs> I think it gets to the core of actually what you do in many ways well yeah there's a I was sort of brought up by my father, who was an amateur carpenter, furniture maker, and so on. He was his big lesson was, which we've gotten from all most of us in the art world have gotten it from a lot of directions about the material. What does the material want to do? Louis Kahn said a brick wants to be an arch, and so the question is, what does the wire want to do? Which is really mean really means what is it good at, and. Uh, the nice thing about it is that you can bend it and rebend it and bend it again, and it's very patient. It does all those things you ask it to do. It doesn't break, or at least the stainless steel we use doesn't break. So you can you can take your time and really work out the first first widget, which is where the genius comes. 
And then, the, and then you sit down and make 50 of them, 60 of them, 500 of them, depending on what the piece you're doing requires. Uh, but, but the wire is forgiving, unlike working in wood or stone or brick or many other materials. That's the, so it's friendly. And if you, if, you, um, if you concentrate on the engineering, beauty just is, is revealed because all the decisions are in the service of this movement. And I've always thought that, that um, with Tim, um, sailing may have had a big influence on the artwork. And you know, the engineering of sailboats um, and this, you know, the sails and all this kinds of sails and how the wind comes. You know, that's an example where the all the decisions are made in the service of something else. So if you make whatever you make, if you if you have that kind of discipline and every decision is focused in this one direction. It's, it's the only way it strikes me that you're going to come up with a new form and you, you're, it's a pure form that you've made because you've discovered it rather than being influenced by this artist or that artist or something in nature and so on. It's it, talking about oh, sailing. The other thing that comes to mind is that, um, you know, what's related to sailing is fishing and the fact that in terms of parts of these sculpture, <laughs> sculptures that are pre-made that you don't have to manufacture, you use things from the fishing world, such That's as right. swivels and, and lead weights that are used right. by fishermen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's true. Um, why don't we go over and uh, look at the wall wheels now, which are quite different. So one thing just for people who haven't been to the museum is that um, we, because we're inside, um, we do have some fans in the museum to move air and that are activated by uh, motion sensors. And uh, these two works are, are activated by that fan you see on the floor there. Um, but um, what, I want to discuss a little bit the origins of these because I know there's a lot of these that you've made over the years. In fact, I'm not sure, what was the first year you made a, a wheel? Oh, it's got to be 20 years ago, mm -hmm. at least. Uh, well, the wheels, you put a pattern in and the wheels as they turn, is it, are they turning? Yes, yes. They are. okay. And you can design all these different patterns. Uh, I always like to use 12 because you can divide 12 up so many ways. Uh, and we play, play tricks so that they pile, all 12 pile into three groups because they're on top of each other or four groups, you have to have a sort of starting point because if it's chaotic throughout the entire cycle, it's not as interesting as if it comes and goes in and out of order. And there's a point in the cycle where boom, it's midnight or it's noon, you know. Uh, they're more interesting actually when they're outside because then you've got the wind on top of it, which has its own moods and so on and is more indecisive. Put a fan on it and, and it's, it just repeats itself patiently and quietly and mysteriously, but it doesn't have that kind of variety and that expectation and then leaving you disappointed sometimes and then surprising you other times. I think, um, Namuel, you want to go close up to the one on the right? Um, these, the thing about these is that the, the, the use of the widgets and, and the kind of the balance and, and little swiveling uh, pieces of wire it, and these are it's quite extreme kind of a tour de force where uh, Tim and David have really figured out a way to to uh, have all sorts of mu movement that's quite mysterious uh, but looking at it the systems are quite simple actually yeah. they're not very <laughs> expressive about the wind I mean because some of the other pieces we looked at, you put them in, we, we put a fan on it because people are going to be in the museum for a short period and we want them to do their thing while the visitor is there. But if you're in a big space like an airport or an atrium of some kind, uh, you, you don't need the fans basically because a big space has got the virtual. Yeah. So we're cheating a little it's good. bit. Right now he's talking about, he, he talked about the, the, um, the mobiles, and now he's talking about 
<laughs> Who's that? Somebody was just talking. I don't know who it was. Yeah, I think somebody I, just unmuted. I think you have to mute the visit the guests. Um, oh, can I do that? Well, not, no, you not you. Not you. Not you. I wouldn't so, touch it. I wouldn't dare yeah. touch it. One thing okay. about the, the, the wall wheels that I think are, are evoked now, and it's something that is that we're getting used to seeing wind turbines in terms yes. of generating electricity on the landscape. Yes. And, and uh, I know, Tim, you've looked at, you know, old windmills that uh, particularly out west where, where windmills were used because there was no other way to pump water where you're in the middle of the Texas, in the middle of the Texas panhandle and you have to get right. water up. But now um, the kind of system or, or the, the, the functionality of one of these wheels is very much based on this technology that's been around for a long time, the, the, the windmill. Right. And uh, these 90 foot wheels are, are considered ugly by so many people. I just, of course, for my money, they're not only beautiful, but they're doing a job that's valuable and needs doing. Let's uh, let's have to be beauty, beautiful for that reason, if no other reason. Let's swivel Sorry. over to uh, homage to Albers here. Okay. So one thing is, um, Tim did study uh, with Joseph Albers, uh, uh, you know, one of the founders of the Bauhaus, uh, teacher at Black Mountain College in the '50s, and then subsequently at Yale, where where uh, Tim brushed up against him, uh, and. Um, this is an example of one of the, the curtains. We were talking about the variety of works and this is a curtain. And uh, tell us about the, the evolution of these and how far back, when, when was the first curtain? I'm not even sure when that- Oh gosh, I, it's been so long I've forgotten. It's been a whole lifetime and, ago. Hey, even be, before my time in, in prehistory. <laughs> <laughs> well, the basic idea is you make this grid and then uh, with, with plates that are reflective I mean, as you see, we don't use color. After studying with the great master of color all these years, I don't use color. I, I like to, I mean, you see, red is basically the only color I ever use, but I like to use work, materials that come with color and just use that color. And particularly I like reflective materials because it will change color as it reflects the, its immediate environment. And so this consists, a piece like this consists of a lot of little squares or circles or diamonds or whatever elements that are free to quite loose in their position. Uh, and as they, they catch different air that goes across the face of the piece, it reflects different colors from the room and the environment. And so it's that richness and change of color that, that these pieces are about. And we call this one homage to Albers because it's square and it has squares within it that are where the piece is changed just a little bit, the way he changes the color and square inside square inside square. And in this case, it's very subtle because of course it's slightly disguised by the movement. So the edges between this type and that type isn't exactly clear. We have, you know, lucky, we're lucky in the installation at the museum that uh, Tim has made, you know, great use of the combination of natural light and artificial light. And you can see, you know, you'll see warm and cool tones in these right. in, in curtains which are really a result of them reflecting the environment, which involves you know, artificial light and natural light. And right now in the afternoon, there's an incredible amount of natural light uh, streaming into the gallery. So I, I can add a, a little bit because you asked about the evolution of these pieces. And it seems to me that these pieces, there wasn't initially as much of a difference between what we call curtains and what we call banners as there is now. You know, after the piece after this maybe, or one after that, that will be viewed, we call a banner. And it, it used to be that we wanted the whole surface to be interconnected in a way that would not allow the individual plates to move. It was, it was quite an, a change for us at first. I think there was a little gasp of surprise and kind of daring. And are we gonna allow these individual plates to simply hang on a loop uh, without being attached to its neighbor, you know, the, the plate itself, the fabric in behind's all hooked up, but the plate itself is quite free. And so I think in the, 
in my view, the major evolution has been towards that freedom where all the movement in the curtains is in the plates instead of the whole fabric of the piece. Do we, Namuel, why don't you go up and if you could look at the edge of the, like look at the piece on the edge so you could see what David's describing as the fabric is the widgets, correct? Yes. So the, 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 the fabric are the bent wires in the back, which form like fabric are woven together. And then the plates hang from this fabric. Yeah. And this will be very uh, easily demonstrated by the, the sculpture in the, in the back room that you're, that you're going to highlight. Um, let's go, let's go um, look at the banner now that we're, the banners have been uh, discussed. We're passing vine here, which is actually picking up some great color now. It looks orange because it's picking up the floor. Huh. <laughs> That's where reflections come in. That, that, that advertises the movement before anything. Just the slightest movement of the plate, this reflective will seem like a big change. So this is uh, this work is double banner. Have to move in on it a little, I think. Yeah, if you get in close to those widgets, it's... Yeah. And you know, it's funny you call it, I, I haven't heard you, any either of you refer to this as the fabric, which is interesting because, you know, we have used the analogy about how making these things is like a craft, like weaving where you're doing a repetitive activity. And it really is like weaving, where you're, you're literally, or crocheting, where you're literally bending these wires over and over again and inter, interlinking them with one another. Well, yes. Yeah, a piece like this, if you put all of squares together in your mind, you got a flat surface in the, in the kind of base position. And the whole thing is the, the form itself, the bigger form is able to curve left and right, concave and convex. It's just like the circles we saw at the oculus piece, which are have a base position of a circle, a, a precise circle. But as the air comes along, it turns it in with oval and you get this wobbling change of angles and softness as the curve goes around. So there's always a base position. Uh, and this is an example of a very smooth transition as it moves because it's, it's very carefully made. And that, there's a lurking decision all the time that, to tune the plates dead flat so that they collectively pick a piece of the reflected room they're in and, and move smoothly across the surface. And on the one hand, and another hand is to detune the plate, so to speak, so that you get a much more uh, prickly, inconsistent, uh, informal pattern, and they catch the light in a kind of abstract way. It's, that's our, that's our, our palette. And that, that I think you know, you're describing one thing that really sets your work apart from uh, both Calder and Ricky is that both of their works, the, the movement is primarily one element moving. They're, they're, the elements are moving, but the, the overall form of the piece is not changing. Right. The, the banner in particular, they're like, it's like a flag, like a, you know, a flag is right. a rectangle right. of cloth, yeah. but in the wind, it could assume an unlimited range of forms as it ripples. And the banner is really, is a flag in some ways. I mean, or I mean, a banner is a flag, I guess. Yeah, exactly. In other words, the question, one of the questions we, we're dealing with is, what if the whole form changed? The form itself changed, not the relationship between this form and that form, but the forms themselves. And the way we found to do it with hard materials and to make hard materials look sensuous is to break them up and to, as you see and then have that what have the field that it represents move and, and then the smallest uh, movement uh, the because of the plates are reflective any colors in the space are moving across the surface of the pieces and that's often how you first observe the movement Let's look at, uh, at um, uh, square square, which is the piece hanging adjacent. Okay. That, um, 
one thing is, you know, as you could see, there, were, there was a wall painted red to bring a little color into the space. Um, one thing that interests me is, you know, you're dealing with moving air, which is the atmosphere, yet your palette of materials, you choose to use materials that are either reflective or, um, or translucent, which really relate in, in many ways to the sky itself or, or, you know, weather phenomena. So, you know, that's, you talk about not wanting to use color or staying away from Albers, but is there some connection between the, your, your interest in movement and wind and the palette of materials also? Well, the, we, we, I could say that our three favorite colors are, two of them are Lexan. This material you're looking at is, is Lexan, which is a fancy pants name for uh, a, pl a plastic. It's, it's the, the champagne of plastics. It comes different thicknesses and different opacities. So it holds the light. So we use materials that reflect or hold the light. In other words, this is very most effective when it's backlit. Uh, and it comes, as I say, different uh, uh, densities uh, so that it, it's soft uh, and it's permanent. It, it looks like glass, but, it does, but it's lighter and stronger and doesn't break. It's perfect for our stuff. And it took me a while because plastics, you know, it took me a while to get used to spending a life working in plastic. Uh, but it's, but, but, the, but uh, it's basically the way it changed handles the light. So our three favorite materials are clear Lexan, foggy Lexan, which is what this is, and and, stain, and aluminum. Those are, our, those are our primary colors. We have a question, Richard, Tim, and Dave, um, about the choice of the red color. Was that a specific color choice for this room? Well, part of the, place that what I am influenced by and where I get it from are the Russian constructivists. And as you know, my Yelovich my sort of reinvented art from square one and, and started with black. And if you could master black, you were allowed to use one additional color and that was red. And then you went through the primaries and he was very disciplined about it. So black and red are kind of the key. I, I, red is the most powerful color. And, uh, you know, we if we want a piece to shout and be a, and be, and demand your attention in a kind of straightforward way, most powerful way, it would be red every time. Uh, so we thought we would light this foggy piece with without any spots on it, but spot the wall next door, and you'd get this kind of it would play of the pink, the influence of the red in a kind of soft pink. And as you move around the room, you. It does work that way. It wasn't as reflective as I thought and not quite as effective as I thought, but it, it, that was the intent in any case. Because mm -hmm. the uh, Lexan is, it reflects it, but in a very soft way. It, mostly it holds the light and, and lets the light through. And, 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 sh and as you see, the elements pile up on top of each other and you get a nice range. Mm -hmm. And also, when you enter the gallery, when you when you first enter the gallery, you can't see the red wall. So That's if, you right. perceive, if you perceive some pink or red in the piece, it's like, where is it coming from? And, and then there's an aha moment when you turn the corner and actually see that there's a red wall and it's reflecting the environment. Right. That's That was the idea. And the piece on the left, the clear piece, is reflecting the window, which is there and all of what's going on outside. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I could see that. The, the, actually, the light is perfect now on this piece. Yeah. Yeah. And the angle is good. Each, um, each room has its own uh, way of highlighting the pieces and even the times of day in the room. Like during the installation, I noticed that that square, square piece that we were looking at and the, the banner and back looked quite, I think, you know, quite a, a difference between morning, we'll say in late morning, noon to around five o'clock, the whole, the light streams in there in the, the morning is quite blue. And then as the sun moves across, the whole color of the room, I think, warms up a little bit. And also, oh, I mean, the piece, uh, Namulan, we're just looking at the clear banner. Yeah. Uh, or, what is that called? What's the piece called? Clear. 
clear curtain. What is that piece called again, Tim? I think that's uh, it, clear that, curtain. At, at certain angles, yeah, it completely disappears. Yeah. But then when you, you rotate, you yeah. move a little bit, and then suddenly it's like it's a mirror, and you're seeing, you know, outside reflected in the gallery. Right. Like right now, there you see it's it's kind of invisible, and we move, and then suddenly, you know, there you go. You start. We start seeing. And so that, that side, you know. And this connection, I know this whole thing with the group is uh, Tim, uh, his background as an architect, there, there's an architectural thing going on here where uh, we've all had the experience of looking at the facade of a, of a, of a glass building and right, seeing right. multiple reflections off the windows. You can see how much the owner paid for the quality of the glass. Sometimes detuned <laughs> pieces are, are, are more interesting. So this is what you deal with. But mostly, again, it's a flat surface, and the and the air and the space uh, manipulates it and tells you other things that you didn't know. And that aspect of su surprise that you mentioned, particularly in this piece, but it's in a lot of the pieces, and that element, when you think of surprise, relates to movement itself. Like if we install a piece in a space, sometimes the most, the highest amount of drama in my book isn't if you walk in and the piece is moving a lot. It's if you walk in and the piece isn't moving at all. And if you pause, look at it, all of a sudden a part starts to move. There's a great, uh, it's unexpected. It comes like a magnet. We have some questions coming in. Maybe we could uh, start okay. answering some questions here. I know I saw one from Dean. Fire away. I could tell a story while we're waiting about my, my wife. We would go to a, a space where I had one of my commission pieces in it and talk to people and she and they would say, Is, and she would bawl me out on the way home, she'd say, it wasn't moving, uh, and I and I, that always was very upsetting. But I would say, you know, the piece is going to fail when people stop looking for the motion. Not when it actually stops, but when they stop looking for it, because they know somehow that that's what it's about. That's why it looks the way it does. It's supposed to move. Um, we have a question here. Uh, from uh, Gary and Susie, uh, oh. your structural wire wire widgets are extreme. Form. How are they manufactured? Via des a design jig, via CAD, CAM, and are they a And how are they prototype bends and hooks designed and determined in order to achieve the structure and movement of the objects of the work? We have the dumbest tool you can imagine, which is a series of steel weights, the size of say a package of uh, safety matches weigh two pounds and we pile them up like uh, uh, minarets with setbacks and setbacks. And that distance between the first setback, the second back is, is the distance of the first bend plus the width of the pliers. So the, sometimes when you're lucky, you get a widget that has a plier width in it and you don't have to measure it, but we try to measure them very careful, carefully and we make them as precisely as can, we can. And we do a piece like the round oculi which is a version of a type of piece that we, we call a zinger, which is basically starts from a straight position and wobbles off that. When we, 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 uh, we, we, we put the widgets together that we made and the plates that we've made, and you, you think you've done it very carefully, but they tell you that they're a little bit off because the balance isn't quite right. So when you, when you get them in context, you, then you start, that's where the tuning begins. But, the, but these blocks that weigh a couple of pounds each are, are the basic tool. It's just un unbelievably simple. I know that, there, must be, there must be on certain pieces a trial and error thing where you, you, oh, of have, course. you, have, to bend, you have to bend a lot of wire to make a, a bunch of widgets and then you discover that they're not quite right. right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. And you've wasted an afternoon. I could see Dave shaking his head and thinking about oh. all the instances. <laughs> bending wire that never went anywhere. Right. <laughs> uh, right. That's, that was a great question, you know, and the, you know, Tim described it 
so well and how simple it is, but in part of its uh, beauty is how adaptable it is. Like if you make a, a few of the widgets and you see that one of the, one of the measurements ought to be an eighth of an inch and a quarter inch more, all you do is move away. And the whole design of widgets, you know, counting for pliers widths and wanting to make it as simple, that enters in also. But uh, we started out 40 years ago, there was a kind of a tug of, of war between a jig and the weights and the, 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 the weights I'm soon won out because of just how flexible they are. We have another question about choosing the wire material, um, uh, whether you've experimented with other materials, but I, I, I know your favorite thing is stainless steel. Well, stainless steel is heavy, of course, and aluminum is light, but stainless steel is slightly brighter and, you, and outdoors aluminum eventually will oxidize slightly. We made a type of piece called wind frame, which is coming in the, there's an example of it coming in the outdoor part of the show. Uh, and they get slightly oxidized, but the difference the way it still catches the light and works just fine, but the stainless is brighter and more intense, but well, much heavier and, and nastier to work with, actually, no, I mean, by your by by in your hands and the, and the edges of the of the material is uh, dangerous. The stainless wire is amazingly strong for its um, size, and we buy it straight and spring tempered. So if you make a, a, a bend, it stays. So the stainless wire, it, it's like our, our body, kind of, our body ligaments or something. They're very, very strong. We did walk, um, there's a question about what's on the wall behind Tim there. And I know Tim, you're in the, the, the clean part of your studio, the, the kind of clean room. <laughs> And that we, there's a series of those small sculptures that you make that we walk through when we're coming up from, uh, right. or actually the uh, Namulan's taking us there now. Okay. Um, and you want to talk a little bit about the small sculptures? Because I know you're, you're constantly tinkering and, and uh, making these, and you've done this for a long time. Right. Well, I don't know. They're a way of looking for how you can make a, an anticipated movement interesting. I mean, they all, it's easy to make something light enough to move. I mean, if you live in a house like ours, which is uh, forced warm air, you know, you can't lose basically, because when the furnace comes on, you know, it's going to move. But to make it look interesting and to make the, the, the for the, those little boxes, each to ask a question, a, a piece like those takes maybe a day or two to make like that. So you get the answer back quickly it's not like building a building uh, and that's one thing about that I one of the attractions of moving from architecture to sculpture is you're moving it with your own two hands and you get the answer instantaneously and if you don't like what you've done you, you can redo it or throw it away and start again and nobody's the wiser but you can't do that in architecture uh, and it moves so slowly and these things are fun to make and I can't stop doing them uh, and, the, and the cage is, the, is a way of making, it's sort of the base in the sense, like the tradition would be to put a figure on a base and the, and the, the base is the separation between the sacred and the profane. And in this case, the, 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 the cage or the space that is defined inside the, the cage is the base. And it also helps to, you can do anything inside that you want because you've got the support of the grid of the base itself. So I don't know, I just find these things intriguing and fun to do. Yeah, and there's, there's yeah, a kind of there's, course. There's, there's no great, no obvious connection between them and the commission, the bigger pieces, really. They're just little studies of their own. Well, I'm going to- You were just going to say the opposite, right? I'm going to say <laughs> because um, these are always pouring forth. And there is a, a, a lot of truth in, in most of them, there isn't a direct a connection, but in many of them, often one of the ideas that, that is being explored in one of these little sketches 
becomes the, the uh, seed for a larger piece. It catches yeah. the eye in a different way. And we right. think that is something new. How can, what are we able to do with that? Yeah, that's where the new ideas come from, but they, yeah. they change their shape as they grow in size. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Often the materials change as well. This is, this is so sort of like our, our seed stock. <laughs> The chicken coop. <laughs> Someone's asked the question whether tools are used for everything. You, you, um, I mean, yeah. do, you do anything, do you bend anything with your hands or is it, it's all pliers, I think. All pliers, it? all pliers. Yeah. You, you you bend things with your hands, but there's, those are soft things. You try to straighten a piece of wire, but they're not, well, they're not. That's why we, we've got racks and racks of pliers because everybody in the shop sometimes wants a particular plier. So we have to have one for everybody. So the one of these, that, and the next thing, I don't know, hundreds, I don't know about hundreds, but we got a lot of pliers. Got pliers like libraries have books. And the only fancy tool we have is a spot welder. Otherwise, it could be anybody's uh, shop in the basement. Yeah, very simple tools. And kind of drill press, paper cutter, pliers. That's about it. And I, I wasn't aware. It's interesting that there was a, uh, with uh, the, uh, the carpet in the lobby we're looking at now, uh, when David was assembling it, there seemed to be one of the pieces were missing. And... Uh, David asked if we had a paper cutter at the museum, and we did. And I had no idea that a paper cutter was such a, an important tool in the oh, making right. of these. <laughs> right. I know, so I made it on the spot. <laughs> the other ingredient you gotta have is good music. Oh boy. Um, someone, you know, Namulin, someone wants to know about the piece that's in the bay window. That's called the fuzz. Yeah, we should go over and look at that. And it's it's interesting because it's the piece in some ways it's the hardest to see. Yeah. And I don't know with right. the sunlight back in the if and we the need hardest to, be able to make the hardest to make. But yeah. like was, so yeah, it it's was, very hard to see. It was positioned outside my wife's uh, window in her study. So when she sat at her desk in the morning, the sun rose exactly behind it and it just was on fire. It's not quite as jazzy in this particular case. I don't know quite why. I think we ought to drop the curtain and try it that way. There's a screen there that might might bump it up a little bit, but it's the hardest to see and the hardest to, to make. But when the sun is right, it's fantastic. That, that took an entire winter to make that. Off and on, it, it drove our, uh, our good friend Dave they being a little crazy. So it's unusual that this piece actually doesn't have any, you know, reflective elements on it, that it's all widget. Right. Well, they are reflective. Yeah. They were, you know? Yeah, they don't reflect anything you can recognize, but they reflect light very nicely. Yeah. So it's, it's a piece you don't make very often, I gotta say. Oh. In fact, it will never be made again. The one thing also about it, the way that the, the wires come off the widgets and go in one direction, it really kind of implies wind in a very direct way. Like there's a sense of movement through it, like the, the materiality directs your eye. Yes, yes. Yeah, right. It really should be outside. Yeah, it's very, very hard to see this, but... Huh. Um, I know there's a question about movement about, and Tim went into this a little bit about when discovering when he first loved movement. And I know you related the story of seeing the Calder at, uh, when you were a kid, but, um, and you alluded a little bit to sailing, like, so you were a sailor? Oh yeah. And I was also a navigator in the Navy. So I've had the wind going on for years in my mind. Uh, oh yeah, because it's, and how did you, it, why become a navigator in the Navy? It, 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 or did you have a natural ability with uh, mathematics and charts? I just got assigned. I was on, flying off the carriers in the Mediterranean. It was a little hairy. It was interesting. It kept my attention. 
But uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, the other thing we haven't talked about actually is what, what is the space that a piece goes in. I mean, when we get a commission, the question is, would you do the same thing? We look for the where the light's coming from, where the traffic patterns of the pedestrians go through it, the angles the piece is seen, and the use of the piece, and the use of the space. In other words, a piece in an airport where people are frantic and nervous and worry about their flight, and they, that's the last thing they want to do is contemplate a work of art and slow down, uh, even though they're looking at something they've never seen before, which intrigues some people, not others. But or, or, or as a contrast to doing a piece for, I don't know, a, a library or a, or a dining room or a place, a place where people f come frequently and stay for a length of time or a, piece, or a place that's you know, frantic with activity and people are rushing through. You might think quite differently about what would be appropriate to do in there. This is on top of all the questions about where's the light coming from, where's the air coming from. Uh, the air is coming from the heating systems and the ventilating system. And sometimes there's a wall of glass from floor to ceiling, and in the winter time it's colder than space inside. So there's a convection current. And in the summertime, the reverse is true. And uh, even a gathering of people sitting around a table can can produce a column of rising air, warm air. And I see that move a piece over here, that over their head, and not over there where there's nobody sitting under it. Sometimes these uh, influences are working together and get quite a push that way and quite a lot of energy and other times they're canceling each other out and they're working on different schedules. So you, there's a lot going on. And if you work with materials that are light enough and make pieces that are light enough, got to be out of reach and out of harm's way. It's even well-intentioned, curious fingers, uh, you're going to have something that it is uh, has its own life in a way. And it tells you something about this space that your eyes can't possibly see otherwise. Or to put it another way, uh, makes the air visible. So that's the sort of mantra behind it all. And these are just different ramifications of our studying it and playing. You, playing with the wind would be the nicest way to put it. Uh, we have a question about the sound that these things make, particularly outdoors. Uh -huh. And, you know, there is a bar sound, but it's not, you don't make these things to make noise. They just end up making noises. Hey, so. Amanda, that's a byproduct. Absolutely. Oh, we had a contract for a bank in Texas inside in the, in the big room in, in the, where you pay your, take your money in and push it out or whatever. And mm -hmm. uh, the, in the contract, it was written that it had to be silent. <laughs> People distracted from the bank, putting their money in the bank. And we haven't heard from it, so I guess it worked out. But outside with the wind frames, you get a nice kind of ripply sound. It's almost this watery in effect. And it's not, it's not, it's quite pleasant actually. And it's more information about what's going on in the air around you. Again, you wouldn't be aware of otherwise. Well, there's the, the rustling and the tinkling sound sometimes. That's right. Yeah, it's a light, light sound. The sound of the, of one of the pieces in the lobby, in a big, fish, some of those elements come around and are stopped by one of the wires. And there is an audible uh, tinkle then. And I heard from some people who work at the Aldridge that it was quite startling at first. They thought <laughs> something was wrong. Mm -hmm. They thought uh, a piece had fallen off the wall in some gallery and they were a little alarmed. And, but no, it was just our piece. You know, that every so often there's a little, a little, Ping. But that's, as I say, a byproduct. Yeah. So we're, we're almost out of time here. I don't know if there are any more questions. Uh, one last question. Do we have anything else? Uh, burning question? Oh, there's a question about music. And Tim, you're, you're a musician, but... Um, uh, Rick, I'm a recovering musician. Yeah. And about the influence of music perhaps on the work. Yeah, yeah. Well, music has its order and it also plays with time. So there's a lot in common, in fact. Uh, and just like music, there's uh, gestures and there's calm, sleepy stories. And I mean, it has all the moods that music has. 
the wind that is. At the all structure of these, I mean, I, I mentioned that a little bit in the, the catalog, but the structure of these, there's a, um, a generative structure which resembles, uh, you know, some of the structure you might find in Baroque music or minimal minimalism, kind of repeated patterns. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And then there's often- The, the thing with, all, it's all dealing with is the, the, the range between order and chaos. And I'd like to think that the pieces go across the line and become chaotic at some point. You think, you know, what was the organization? And then that goes back over along the line and you see the order. And it's most interesting if it if it does if it does cross the line back and forth and doesn't just stay on its own side. And I think that there are times in music. Uh, I was listening to Sacre Printemps the other day, and I mean that's like a fantastic range of of moods all in one piece of music. And if you could do that sculpture, you'd be a you'd be a genius like Stravinsky. Where we keep trying. <laughs> We'll keep trying working at it. Um, so we've run out of time. It's just about six o'clock. And I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. And I hope you all get to the museum to see the show. Um, and uh, we do plan, you know, we're going to develop some more programming around the exhibition as we go into the summer and the fall. So uh, keep tuned uh, to further things that uh, we'll be doing with, with Tim and David and the, the, the work in the show. And um, I hope to see you all at the museum. And hopefully, uh, we're going to be uh, coming out of this pandemic as we go through the into the fall of this year. Uh, be a little bit, be able to be out and about a little bit more. Right. Excellent. Well, thank you, our gracious host. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everybody. The old and Good. thank you. I want to thank Namulin for organizing this, and Lorena, who uh, have been. Uh, Lorena's been behind the scenes here and getting us all to work this afternoon, which, as you know, can be trying sometimes. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, Tim and Dave and Richard, for hosting. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Cheerio. Bye.